I'd now like to invite up on the stage Devor Anasik. Uh, Devor has spoken before at the conference, has a very good and deep thinker about AI, and uh, you're going to talk about what AI can offer property marketplaces and how to implement it. So thank you very much for coming again. Thank you, Simon, for the invitation. Hello, everyone. So I think the Simon told everything today in the morning, so I'm happy for you. Okay, I'm happy that I don't have to do anything. <laughs> so, but in short, from search to tell, I agree completely. That's the change we are all about to witness in, in the following months and years. And why? Because the AI is now technology that can deliver on these promises. But still, it's your businesses and you have to implement it. You will do it internally, you will hire some of the great tech providers from here, you will do it your way. But okay, let me tell you a bit of some more use cases that I put here. Fortunately, I didn't put too much because there will be just repetition. But I'll tell you a bit about technology and try to make understand what is it behind and why today this technology is giving some kind of different change than all the previous tech bubbles. So, okay. That's us. We are a small AI-focused service provider with the caveat that we are in the horizontal industries, horizontal marketplaces, and also doing a lot of different uh, AI cases for different clients. So we are quite experienced uh, doing this, what we do. So, of course, some AI consultancy and everything. And we are oriented uh, more, as you can see here, more horizontals, not so much real estate, but last year I was here with like a new guy with a new technology, and now I'm happy to hear that everybody's talking about it. So from my perspective, it's good development, of course. This is something we launched very, very long time ago, 2016, and we are very proud that this, of course, updated models, but still work and make a really good ecosystem. So very fast, visual-only search on Wilhaben in Austria. I'll now give you some of the use cases that I put on my presentation. Some of those you have seen, some not. Here's the first one, and nobody mostly didn't go into details. So in my opinion, the biggest way how you can profit from new technology is actually using it in-house, and using it as a combination of knowledge base and large language models. Why? Because all big companies have a lot of data that's very valuable, but very hard to access from the internal employees, to understand where it is, to understand how to approach it. People don't know how to write SQL queries or anything. They, they will never do in marketing. So what we now have, we have this chat interface. That's a new thing. So yes, allow them to do it. And I, I spoke about this use case last year as a potential. At that time, technology was not there yet. Now, you can deliver this. There are clouds dedicated for doing custom LLMs with trainings, adding some additional knowledge database, some graph database that will feed to the LLM and that will encompass your whole internal knowledge and you will be able to give your employees what they need. And again, the new thing is, of course, that it's a new thing. You have to take care of some things, who can see what and other stuff, but it can be all solved nowadays and for reasonable price. It wasn't that a year ago. So I think that's the biggest thing you should think of. And then, of course, there's a, there are productivity tools are just popping up. So either Microsoft ecosystem or Google or something third, they will all have generative AI features in it and do educate your employees to use it because they will become more efficient. Okay, then we, this use case is, you've seen it maybe three or four times in this conference now, like, okay, you can generate listing descriptions from images, from text, from structured data. It's now affordable. Of course, there are things that are not so good with it. Maybe they will all be look-alike. Maybe technology is not that perfect yet. Maybe it's harder to control still. So you will, someone will have to take care of something you try. So with all this new technology, you have to play a bit. Then image tagging. So we are more on the image side, guys, and we do understand the images, and they never can uh, tell enough that you can get information from image now. And now you can do it affordably for a reasonable 
amount of effort. And then these tags can be used in searches and in everything else. So yes, do it. Do for, but do it for things that are important to your clients. Is it a swimming pool? Is it a fireplace or something? These are important things. So off-the-shelf products will not do it that easy, but you take either one of the specialized uh, provide, tech providers for your, for real estate, or you do it yourself internally. That's also a good option today because you can do it. And then we come to the thing that Simon actually said, yes. But what we are doing all the time, we are all matchmaking. We are make, matchmaking the guys that want to buy and the properties at, the, at this point. So yes, use it for more advanced searches. The searches nowadays have to include some AI features. And you can do it several ways. In the end, searches are transforming slowly. People will go in more and more specific. They will get used that they can do it. So it's not that they now don't want to do it. They just couldn't. So they had to do filtering. And now with the new AI that, that is available, so just slowly the ecosystem will, or faster, but it will change. So slowly you have to adapt your way of searching and matching. And large language models will allow you here to do a lot of that that you couldn't bef before. And then, of course, some basic stuff that are still not solved on many marketplaces. Duplicate detection on ads level, now it can include images and text and everything. So these are basic stuff. And of course, again, images, caption, description of images. For the first time, you can get really good description of images, images that are automatically generated. So yes, use all this. Why not? And that, that's for my use cases in your domain. So I'll now go on a bit different level to give you a different perspective to try, you, try to give you some, what is it behind this technology? Why it works like it works? And why, is it, why it is important? So where, where we are today? What AI can do? It can generate images. It can write software code. And it can write it really good. So make your software developers use uh, Microsoft Copilot or anything else. At this point, I heard last week that around 40% of this year's code put on GitHub is actually AI generated. 40%. And this is the first year of usage. So just think about it. You want to have efficient development, they have to use it. And of course, it generates text. It's still not generating really good presentations. It will. Now, this hallucination things we all talked about, I can tell you it's much less. You try ChatGPT 4, don't go for an old version 3.5. It's much more polite, it's aligned, it talks positive. It allows longer context uh, conversations. So you can refine what you are looking for. You can go in more, more details. You can feed it with more input to get better output. And it became multimodal. So now you can even input with images and with files and with graphs, new, 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 new version from, that will be after the BARD from Google, will have even more capabilities than one from OpenAI. Let's see that. We are waiting for a year for them to respond, so maybe now they will. And it will change what we do. And of course, now these models are connected to internet, which they were not six months ago. So these are really big changes. And then you can get such perfect images. So last year I was showing some like really, wow, how things can be generated. And now, I mean, you, you can't believe the level of details it generates. It's only a year after. So in a way, this progress is very fast. Even for us that are in the area, it's hard to, on a weekly basis, just follow all the new papers that seem very important. So that's one of the also important things. Understand the technology is changing very fast. What was true three months ago, maybe now it's not true. So you need some source of new information all the way from some of the guys within your company that will just follow. And then this is my proposal for the AI strategy for all of you. I mean, it's for any company. Just you always do what you do in your business. You address the pain points of your clients or your internal processes, and you want to improve. And that's why you use all the technology. But then, with this technology, I think you really need to put some enthusiast about it that's on the right position in the company that can really steer the process, that can really drive the internal transformation towards an AI company once. <coughs> then you need to build internal skill set. 
So you can never rely only on external, uh, just, just vendors. So yeah, build internal skill set. Then you can find some internal knowledge, some good companies, and then combine it. Then iterate, then do fast trials. Try it, see how it works. Use the off-the-shelf product at the beginning, then maybe you will develop something more advanced on your own, and then evaluate performance of AI products. That's something that's usually forgotten for some reason, and in some areas it is really not easy. So personalization is really hard. Why? Because at the end you don't know what your clients see. It's not AI that's the problem here. Any personalization was always very hard. It can be done, but you have to put the whole system around to understand what you did. So don't forget that part. At the end, once again, train your employees to use these productivity tools based on AI. It will help your productivity overall. And now I'll give you some basic concepts that I really think are worth remembering on AI, that AI is like a buzzword. Nobody knows. I mean, just abbreviation, nothing else. But I'll give you some concepts. Try to, try to embrace some of them. So, what happened? Why are we are talking now? I mean, neural networks are here since the 60s. But enough, something really happened that's new. And that was in 2017, this paper from these Google guys there. They, they, they really thought of a really clever thing. Before, everybody tried that neural networks learn all data in the big database. But then they said, OK, no, no, no. The important thing is those that have attention. So we need to uh, have a mechanism that gives attention only to important things. And what's important? Important is thing that changes the state. So then I'll give you an example. What changes the state? What's the state? So we have, what are neural networks doing anyway? They're only predicting the next world, nothing else. It's that simple. But if I talk about capital of Spain, and I say capital of Spain is Madrid, yes, any statistical engine, will always give this answer. That's the most probable correct answers. But all the other answers here are also correct. So capital of Spain is a beautiful city. Capital of Spain is where our conference is. But which is the context right for the right answer? Depends on the broader context. And that's what this attention mechanism did. It gave neural network the possibility to try to understand broader context. And remember, chat GPT is chat, and then general pre-trained transformer. And transformer actually uses attention mechanism to transform words and sentences and just, you know, uh, concepts that we have in our head in the multidimensional vectors by this attention mechanism. And then it turns out that if you, if you understand the broader concept, you will get better results in predicting next word. It's that simple, nothing else. And at the end, this technology is 2,000 lines of code, is transformer, nothing else. And then you just stack, you know, billions of them in this layer and others in this layer. And I mean, in a way, you make this software structure very complex, but by the very simple basic algorithm. And it learns conceptual nuances. That's new. And it turns out that in a way it becomes creative because I would say creativity is algorithmic in a way. And why? Because to summarize is to learn. When you summarize something, you, you, in a school, you tell kid, can you summarize this lecture? And then you know that it learned. It understood the most important concepts. And that's the thing. And large language models understand principles. And in a way, they become some kind of knowledge filters. And they have this compression that is unprecedented. So, for instance, stable diffusion, image-only model, compressed 100,000 gigabytes of images to two gigabit file. And at the end, LLM is file. It's not a software, it's not a program. It's two gigabit file that compresses all knowledge from all these images and understood all concepts and can create new images based on that. And why it's new images? Because this image was not in a database, because there was no 30... There was no old lady driving a cab in Madrid in 1935. It's not possible. But it understood all these concepts. And it could generate this new thing. So I say it's creativity. That's, that's my take. Someone will not agree. <laughs>
But okay, one other concept I wanted to learn. So now you have some LLM, you train it on some data. Uh, so you need something more. You want to make it behave. You want, you want to tell it is it giving you right answers or not. And how you do it? You do it by reinforcement learning. How do you tell your kid what's the difference between the dog and a cat? You don't describe all the details on a, is it furry, what's the color, does it bark, or does it meow, or what? You just say concept, you say, yeah, this is dog, and the kid tries next time, it says it's cat, you say, no, 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 this is dog, and this is cat, and just by giving feedback, it's possible to learn complex concepts. That's the basic thing, and that's how actually now OpenAI made uh, ChatGPT4 much more aligned with what we all think is okay then there is a problem what's alignment and what are the values. And in my opinion, in the long run, there will be different models in different societies, parts of the world, because yes, we don't have all the same values, but this is how you can tell it not to offend you, whatever offends you. That's, that's the system, this reinforcement learning. It's, it's a really simple system, and it, you just give it feedback. And just one more also, also here that's really important, this interface. So now you talk in English with the software or file, and it gives you different inputs, and you can reiterate several times. So the new thing here is we are all programmers. You don't need to know how to code in Python. You can only talk in plain English. Even in Croatian, I can talk now. Very okay, no problem. It really understands me. And that's, that's why you know, the adoption rate is going through the roof, and it will. And that's the future. We all want to talk to our computers. We don't want to program them. There will be some space for software developers. I don't think that will go away. But now people will be able to actually get what they want from these uh, files. <laughs> so yeah. And the new thing, ChatGPT4 now can see, hear, and speak. That's from the 25th of September, so quite new. Yeah, you can upload file now. Yeah. You can upload images, in other sense, images. So things got really, I would say, they are accelerating. They are got getting efficient. Have in mind, there are a lot of large language models out there. I'm aware about maybe 250 to 300 different models, different variations, a lot of open source. It's available, you can use it, you can implement it, and it's commercial free to implement it. So go for the Facebook ecosystem, they start with Llama 2, there are so many versions of it, and, you, and, and it's proliferating. So it will not go away. And it won't be one model to rule them all. It won't be one company to give service to everyone. Everybody will use it. Someone will take service, someone will develop, someone will customize, someone will, you know, everything will be there. In the long run, AI will be more intelligent than us in one part of intelligence. So there are several, you know, intelligence concepts and what is intelligence, but in this remembering concepts and combining them, and even I would tell this, it's creative, but have in mind, our creativity is in our mind in three dimensions, and when you want to have a pattern recognition, that's your limit, but AI has 30,000 dimensional space to find the pattern, so it looks very creative when it takes out something you could never think of. Yes, because it has much more connections between everything, all the concepts in, in, it, in its head. Yeah. So where we are at the timeline, this is my slide from the last year. Last year, I said uh, we are in you know, beginning of mass production, Henry Ford, 1908. But where we are today, I would say we moved 25 years in one year. Have this in mind. So we are not, not only starting of mass production, we are actually having usable models proliferating everywhere, getting better and better experiences using it, and really things are moving fast. And this was also from the last year, biggest AI trends that I presented, and I said, okay, I think the most important ones are democratization of AI, so yes, AI will be hosted in the cloud, everybody will be able to use it with low code and everything, Generative AI will be dominant, and working alongside AI, so augmented working, is important. And I still think these three are dominant. I just added two more. I think now you have this large language model, and you say it's not perfect in my niche. Yes, it's not. It knows a lot about everything. But a lot of models that are for your niche are being developed. Just 
what I mean with niche is like, you know, neurosurgery or medicine in general or psychology or, I don't know, cars or anything. So a lot of specialized models are being developed. There is a rumor that even ChatGPT is now 12 models in behind. It's not confirmed because they have closed system. Uh, in the long run, uh, we will all live in a world where ensembles of these models and AI agents will live and work. Agent is a model that control other models and doing like that. So I'm at the end of my time. I'll finish on this slide. Yeah, so I have several more, but I think it's enough and whoever wants can go for some more caveats on alignment and everything. But yes, thank you very much. Devo, thank you very much. I always love listening to you present because every time, it's like uh, it took years for us to have conversations in um, this conference around getting close to the transaction and we were slowly getting close to the transaction. Here I'm watching in real time, literally from this time last year to you presented in Miami to here, each presentation is different, okay? Because the evolution, re revolution, it's not an evolution, it's a revolution, is happening so fast. So that's what I love about that. And, and the way you think about it is, I think is fantastic. Do you know any portal that uses AI to fuel their revenue growth? I mean, you heard just so many examples. You, you showed them today, so I will not repeat. <laughs> okay. Um, but no, but that, that, that's you one. I think what a lot of these examples were were very high level, very basic usage, you know, equivalent to your Model T Ford, right? Is anyone, are you seeing anyone who's sort of getting much further down the path? Uh, I would say not yet, because it takes some time. Ha have in mind, you know, possibility to locally train neural networks in the cloud disappeared during this summer. It's like just three months. And then you need to test it, to try it. I guess some companies are already internally using it, but it's much riskier to expose it to the world. So it, it will take some time to adopt. Yeah. So, so what we've got is the technology is moving at light speed, but our usage and adoption, not so much adoption, but our focused usage of the product or the technology is lagging because we haven't really worked out how best to use it. Yes, it, it will take time to find the best use cases you want to solve first. There are so many options where you can go, so someone will go to this option, to the second one, and yeah, but slowly to proliferate and you will then copy the best use cases that you see on the market. That's, that's how things yep. progress. Okay. That's normal. And then what's going to be the biggest barrier to this? Is it going to be people, human intelligence, which uh, um, I don't remember who spoke. I think it might have been Ryan, actually, more talk about human intelligence, finding the right people who can work, who understand how this truly works, because everyone, anyone can say AI. It's actually not that hard. But integrating it and implementing it is far more complex. So is the biggest limitation people? Uh, yes, on this discovery part. So what are the use cases that I could do, actually? So th that's what I say. Get AI enthusiast into, into your corporation and just interact with him. And he will give you ideas, and you as a business, you will decide what's your, where your business wants to go. But you need to summon with ideas, with, with ideas that are going all around the place. And then you have to choose. That's the only way. So yes, people are in that way. Because yes, you need to think, you have to understand the business and what AI can do. So it takes time to learn one or the other, of course. <laughs> so if you were a, uh, a senior manager, a C-level person, running a portal, running a prop tech business, how would you engage with the product on a daily basis? Because I was thinking about your analogy of the training the kid with the cat and the dog, right? It's not like do it once and it's done. It's, it's a daily ritual, and eventually it just happens. How would you engage with the product to truly understand the, the power and the potential? I mean, you need to start using it. That's one point. And you need someone that will give you ideas what else you could use it for. So that's why I think these productivity tools, when everybody starts using it in their working day, so Excel analysis just become more clever then you will, ha, huh, that's now much more easier. So you will slowly become everybody in the, in the company. You should have some kind of you know, idea box for AI usage within a company, maybe something like that. I mean, and on a, of course, and you only have to think strategically where to invest. Yeah. So, yeah. so <coughs> some questions here. 
Um, how will AI agents impact property portal marketplaces? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. That's, that, I, I didn't think, uh, maybe, maybe here, I, I apologize. Uh, now I realize it. Agents in your world is different than in AI world. I think AI agent is the, the the AI that you let to go on an internet to make an inquiry to other AI, maybe to people, to give some result back, to rethink it, to do it again. So that's an AI agent, it's not a real estate agent. But yes, having such machines could change a lot. Just think about it. It can go and can give maybe a pro you know, ask for the properties, then come back, consult with you, maybe get some additional data then refine the search, find, so you can go in deeper finding what you're li really looking for, and then it can maybe even bid for you. So that's all the future, uh, it's not that close, that part. Okay. Yeah. A big problem for, uh, the number two question here, the big problem for the practical application of AI for property search is performance. How will that it, be it, Yeah, it, you don't use large language model for everything. Yeah? So you need specialized models you want to do, uh, image, ext image extraction, you go for some specialized model. So, for instance, our, our you know, visual search work works within 50 milliseconds. Come on, find me visually similar images. You don't need to do, so you always have to optimize what you're using for what usage, and then you will not have this problem. Yeah. Okay, we'll do the top one, the long one first. I like the way you did the Spain example, um, but any practical example of a situation in which this would be useful when AI is engaging with a renter or buyer and recommending properties? Yeah, let me think. I'm not from your, your industry, you remember that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah I, I don't know, I mean, I, it's maybe this negotiation phase. It's negotiating, then it maybe wants to retract this offer because it sounds like you will, you will maybe, maybe it understands, maybe it will go down with price from your responses, then said, okay, I'm not interested, so, <laughs> you know, it's, it's possible to, when you go in this chat thing, and you have certain optimization function that you gave AI, just give me the lower price and negotiate as long as you can, maybe it can really do in this interaction with the humans, uh, do much more than you would. Because it's not impatient, it doesn't care. It has optimi optimization function that you gave it. So, yeah, it, it, it will never go for a sale. It, 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 yeah, it doesn't care about anything. So it comes <laughs> the ultimate pain in the backside for negotiation. Yeah, well, but, but won't you then end up just two AI agents negotiating yes, as that, each that, other? That, that I wanted to say yes. <laughs> that, that's risk in the future, yes. But let's see, let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure people will just let... Uh, so there is a regulation here. Are, uh, will regulators allow that AI negotiate in your, will it be you know, transparent? If it's transparent, maybe it will uh, just act differently as a human or another AI. If it's not transparent, but it will be very hard to detect, have that in mind. And I already know some people that use AI for negotiating real estate, uh, not disclosing that they are using it. So, yeah, it can be done, but it's, it's interesting. We'll see. They're all uh, second-order magnitude effects that will happen in such, you know, environment that goes back and forth. Uh, we are not sure where will we end. On okay, that. so last question from me. You mentioned regulation. Where do you see that going? Because we, we all hear about AI going crazy. We have the, the Elon, Elon yeah. Musk of the world saying we should stop and think. What's going to happen? My next slide. Uh -huh. that they didn't go in details, was that nobody in AI world, so the biggest minds, can't predict where AI will be in two years. I mean, CEO guys, C-level guys, uh, academic guys that are 30 years in, in, in the area. So it's hard to regulate thing when you don't know where, where will it be in two years, and it takes like two years to regulate. So I think you actually did a good job retracting AI Act and postponing it for almost a year, and I just hope they will not come too soon because then l there's a risk of damage. Yes, there needs to be regulation on privacy issues, on maybe copyright issues. A lot, a lot of things are here that need some over, overview. It, it can't be Wild West. It needs to be regulated. But I, my, I, I would go in a way, open models, clear understanding what data went in. So you, you're training a mind. You need to know what you put in. At the end, it's some kind of knowledge filter but it acts on the data you put, and then it's static. And then the prompting is actually prompting this mind to give you some answers. You need to know what's basically in, 
And we don't know now with ChatGPT, so have this in mind. Yeah? So I hope uh, that EU will go in this regulation through transparency. That's, that's the only way. I longer. guess the fundamental problem is the EU may go down the path of some regulation. Other markets may not. And, and the there is a big web, and you can deploy it everywhere. Yeah, that's, that's and then today's world is complex. <laughs> so, so when do the machines take over? Uh, it will take some time. Or it, it, I mean, well, given what you're showing up here, it's not going to be very long. So, so he, okay, that's just the digital world. We still have this physical world for us, for now. It's our problem is that we put our lives in a digital world. I mean, nobody told us to do it. We did it ourselves. Yes. It gives convenience. But yes, it gives some risk. I understand that. Yes, and then when I go to a door to open and it looks at me and goes, no. Or my phone then looks at me and goes, no, not today, Simon. I'm not going to open yeah, myself. Yeah, dy dystopian uh, things are here. I don't, go, don't want to go that way. They are, they, they are the biggest risk. And they're not coming from, a, from AI. Have this in mind. They're so I don't, I don't have... Human ideas, the dystopian world is good and there is like... Someone who rules all of us, and that's not AI. So, yeah. 2001, a space odyssey, and the pod bay door, I don't have to worry about. Yeah. I'm looking for a you know, positive future with AI. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Devor, thank you very much. Thank you.